All right, we're live. So um, we're doing a special early morning edition um, this week to align with our schedules and to also align with uh, some post WAL um, timing. So <clears throat> I guess we'll uh, just go through uh, one by one. Um, first match, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Doug Ehrlich and uh, Tony Katowski. And yep. uh, did you see that match live, Joe? Because I know Gabby and I yeah. both missed that one. I watched it live. How'd it go? Uh, very first start, it kind of, it looked like for a second that it was going to go inside, and then Tony just posted with crazy rotation and uh, took Doug's hand completely, and then he just dived in right away, just all in, and it didn't go anywhere. And then uh, I think they, I think it was an elbow foul, possibly for a restart but anyways Doug got hurt the first match I mean you could you could tell it was yeah yeah I talked to him this morning he said he uh, detached a tendon in his elbow yeah uh, he's in a sling now and I think he has to go talk to a specialist at some point but it sounded oh, pretty, yeah. pretty bad he's you could you can hear him talking to Rob after the first match saying that he heard it pop three times and it sucks what do you do? Yeah, and so did, like, did, go ahead, copy. Did he did he keep pulling, or was it a forfeit yeah, after the first match, dude? Ah, dummies. Wow, good for him though. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of unfortunate. Cool. I thought I thought Doug was gonna clean that match up uh, pretty good, but I mean, shit happens. He said once lost his hand in that first match, the direction he chose. He said he just got out of position, and then when he went to yeah. To press on it, that's when the injury came. Um, but yeah, I didn't. That match, without the injury, that wouldn't have been a sweep by any means. No, it looked like it was had the makings of something awesome. So it was closer than what you would have expected, because I think you were like pretty heavy on Tony. Well, I definitely in the in the beginning, you know, like before I saw the dude's appearances afterwards. You know, then I was like, wow, Tony looks really small. I don't know. And uh, I, I kind of knew he was going to take his hand, you know, but I just didn't know it was going to be in that fashion. And, like, I don't know. Tony, I was surprised both ways, but it was I, – I mean, we're definitely probably going to see that match ran again. I mean, no, you, right? no, you, no, you won't. You'll never see Doug pull again. Doug's yeah, done. I mean, that's, that's a pretty brutal – that's a pretty brutal injury. I mean – I mean, we'll see. I mean, I think Doug, regardless of what he says at times, I think he really loves arm wrestling. But uh, oh, I agree I mean, I for know, sure. I don't know if I'd come back after uh, a tendon rupture or something mm -hmm. like that. At I, least I don't. I probably, I probably wouldn't come back natural. I tell you that much. Yeah, I I hope he does come back because I love the guy. But usually, what happens is guys guys that are um, consistent and super passionate. Uh, you know, like Craig Soubier has multiple injuries, keeps bouncing back. Doug's kind of like guys that bounce in and out of the sport, um, kind of like, you know, just based on motivation and stuff like that or family, whatever, what have you. Um, something like that m might just shut it down for good, but I hope we see him again. He's a, he's a great puller. Okay. And then, um, so Tony went up, he won that 3-0, Doug injured. Um, probably not much more to say there other than wishing Doug, uh, you know, a quick recovery. Hopefully it doesn't impact work or anything like that. Um, what was the second match, Joe? Uh, second match was uh, Jordan Sill and Storm Chilino. Oh, right. Yeah, I did see that one. And so that was 3-0 yeah, also, right? That was 3-0. Yeah, Storm just crazy. Like, domination, dude. Awesome. That's I wanted Storm to win. I, I didn't exactly know if he was going to win, but I wanted him to win. So Storm 3-0, I know I probably, if I remember hand correctly, control, I, picked, I, picked dominating hand control. I picked Jordan 3-0. Do you remember your prediction, Gabby? Um, I think I was leaning towards Sill only because, um, <clears throat> like, Sill's a – like we were talking about Sill. Sill. Sill can almost beat anyone on any given day, and sometimes he looks like a – a lower level pro, um, he can he can he can do both. Uh, but I just thought he was he's the he's a bigger man. I thought um, Storm Storm needs to have hand control. 
and I didn't think he was going to get it with Jordan. Apparently, he did. I didn't see the match, but obviously, he did. So just oh, uh, he got it. yeah, dude. Uh, so, full uh, hand control. Yeah. So kudos to Storm. He's a you know good dude. It was awesome. But yeah, yeah I, I, I recall having Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, Seal tends to uh, kind of go low hand mm. um, on people, and so Storm has a very good post and looks he like he just dominated. Over. Yeah, he dominated the top of Seal's hand. Mm. Um, so, I would even, I would even yeah. say, you know, thumb lock, index finger, middle finger. There wasn't much yeah. low finger control from Storm. Not that it mattered, but I mean, it was definitely high post and, and rotate. Mm. Uh, yeah, that, that was that was pretty interesting. I mean, the matches didn't stop, and if they did. The storm was in position, and Jordan doesn't have that kind of side pressure to uh, go across the table, um, mm. especially without the strap. They never even went to the strap, if I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong. Oh, that's the crazy part. Sometimes I, I find myself asking, how is it possible that a man with the bigger hand, because Jordan does have the bigger hand, uh, well, the longer hand, and, and it's a very thick hand too. Jordan, Jordan has a big hand compared to Storm, and yet lose complete hand control. Um, I give up hand hand size to everyone I've ever pulled, and I don't understand if you could have the bigger hand. What's what's missing in your training? That the you wrist. Keep, well, I, I know right? exactly, but I mean, you there's something there's something definitely missing, and something fundamental missing in your training. I believe. I, uh, I think it's the. Uh, I don't know if it's a strength deficit. It could be a technical thing. So, J Jordan may have a decent riser. Maybe he doesn't. But he, I know he doesn't choose to use it. Mm -hmm. Again, very much a low hand mm -hmm. um, top roller. So by default, Storm had an opening, and it's it's, for sure. it's high. It's high on his index knuckle, but you still have to be strong enough to expose Jordan there. Yeah. And so uh, that's exactly what he what, executed uh, really good. Yeah, I I knew Storm was the more uh, technically proficient arm wrestler going in. I just thought Jordan would have a little bit more um, enough enough hand and enough arm to get the match where he needed to go and win, but that's that's why they do it. You never know. Yeah, and, and with respect to the arm, I think the strap might have changed this match a little bit. And uh, I mean, I think this is something that a lot of people don't understand, especially amateurs, new guys. Man, it's very hard to go up there and uh, execute your game plan um, to a T. It's easy to do it in practice. All must slip. All must go to the oh, strap. Yeah. Um, but boy, you go up there, you get cracked one time. It's very hard to keep focus. It's yeah. very hard to remember everything, especially. So in this match, WAL will give you the straps after 30 seconds. Yeah. Right. If I'm Jordan Seal, again, armchair quarterback, you know, Sunday more. I mean, the Monday morning quarterback and um, just waste the time and go to straps around one. Don't even burn your hand. Yeah. Uh, again, I think it's very it's far more difficult than people think to actually go up there consistently. Yeah. Um, execute a game plan against someone who is as strong, if not stronger, than you. Yeah. I want to ask you guys something as well. You ever notice? Like, I, I see a lot of times, especially in this, in this, in the wall format, where the guy's pulling and he has his teammates and coaches and girlfriends, whatever, yelling, and you know, between matches, they're yelling, "Do this, do that." And I know that um, in my in my past, I've I've had people tell me after the fact, "Oh, I was telling you to do this," or I was, "You didn't hear me," and I said, "I hear nothing." When I get to the table and the, and the I hear everything else gets shut down. I hear I hear absolutely nothing, and. Um, I wonder if, like, do you guys ever hear anyone and has ever, anyone ever said anything or yelled anything to you that actually help you come back, make an adjustment, and win a match? Uh, go ahead, Herman. Um, yeah, I think I've gotten cues at times that helped. Um, I think I've gotten cues at times that could have helped, I did, and I went against it anyway, and maybe it still worked out. And I also know there are plenty of times where I don't hear anything. Mm. Um, a specific example is I remember pulling Alan Ford in 2015. I think I was up 2-0 and had massive hand control, but um, I, I even posed with them in a couple, you know, positions, flat-handed, and Bob Brown's going, dude, chill out with the posing, hit them quick, you know, because you're going to get burnt out by round three and four, and then you're going to lose the damn thing. Um, so round Four comes around and I lose my hand. I'm up 3-0. And so I'm thinking mid-match, okay, Bob, according to Bob, I should just let the match go, take the extended break, come back round five, finish it off. Um, but I chose to just go balls to the wall. Mm -hmm. And I ended up winning that match. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a, a broke back wrist, wrist in the strap, blocked with the shoulder, 
and then rose up through my uh, riser and pronation without my hand and ended up getting my hand back and taking Alan's hand. So that could have, that could have, I mean, that could have gone the wrong way, but mm -hmm. yeah, at times I hear stuff, at times I don't. Um, yeah. I also find it's like, I, Bob, go ahead, Joe. I, uh, I have one, one example that I, I've gotten coaching and listened and, you know, paid attention to it. And that was a challenge match that I had in 2017 in December. Uh, John Brown was living here at the time and, you, you've probably seen him comment here and there. The James Connor, he's the mm -hmm. the ginger from North Dakota. He uh, he was doing a lot of shit talking and whatnot, and ended up pulling this challenge match with him. And <clears throat> one of the matches, John just told me to keep attacking rotation instead of uh, trying to like slide super. I was making some ad adjustments that were a little bigger than they needed to be. Mm -hmm. John was behind me just talking to me. And that's the one time that I've actually paid attention and listened. Otherwise, yeah, it's pretty much nothing, uh, especially bracketed tournaments. I don't hear shit. When I get to that table, it's mm -hmm. shut down mode. Like, I'm, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I find it a little bit like boxing where your, your corner man tells you, you know, you go in and, you know, execute your game plan exactly like this. And, you know, for about 30 seconds you are, and then you get tagged. You know, by, by, and all of a sudden you're like your instinct, your primal instincts kick in, and your your competitive, and then you're just you just turn into a like a, a pure aggressive, res, you, know, you respond purely aggressively um, and instinctively. I find arm wrestling can be like that too. You have this perfect plan, all of a sudden something happens, and then it's all of a sudden you revert to your your natural uh, survival methods, right? Um, hey, it's two killer. comments. Two comments yeah. to that. Did Mike Tyson say everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face? Yeah, exactly. All right. That was yeah. comment. The second comment is Devin also had a plan. We'll save it for later. <laughs> he said he was going to go inside and then boom, Kings move. Yeah. I, 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 got, I finally got one prediction right. And my prediction was with all his blah, 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 um, he was going to run. He was going to run. And it's exactly what he did. Um, hey, I can, hey, Bobby, let's, let's save it for yeah, the end. Yeah. Though. For sure. Because yeah. that's going to be the bulk of the time here. Yeah. Um, one more coaching story. Um, I was at UAL 9, and um, I was pulling Jeremy Petruncio. I had never beaten him right-handed. Um, and a guy named Cody Levi, I think he's one of Hoffman's uh, friends. He's one of my friends, I guess, at this point. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen the guy compete. Um, maybe not even pull on a practice table. But he said, hey, man, I was watching Jeremy in that other match with Mike Gould. You should rise on him right before the start. And sure enough, I rose on him, dumped his wrist. That allowed me to get my hook in, and I beat him. Nice. So it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. A comment essentially from a non-arm wrestler, but an arm wrestling fan um, in general, and it got me a win that I'd never gotten before. Nice. But, um, yeah, I thought the cool story. Um, so next match was uh, Nancy Locke and Victoria Carlson. Um, Victoria won 3-1, but they were all barn burner hooks, hook <laughs> matches. Um, yeah. What, what do you think? What are my thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty interesting. I mean, I didn't watch all of the matches because we were we were having practice at the time, and uh, I was training the the older uh, Carlson boy. And uh, they were watching it. I was on the opposite side of the table, so I couldn't see the entire match. But from what I did see, yeah, it was – that was pretty intense armor, especially from a couple of ladies. I mean, nothing – I mean – Let's just be honest. There's they don't have as much power as dudes, right? So it's cool to see him pull like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean sure Nancy Locke came back after yeah. like a twenty plus year layoff from high level competition. I mean, I definitely thought Victoria was gonna sweep this. I did. I, I actually had her picked because I don't know much about the other person. And I mean, I haven't been around too long, but from what I heard, I knew she was legit. I just thought that Victoria was gonna have too much. Surprise! What do you think, Chris? I didn't see it, but I can tell you I, I know Nancy Locke. Uh, she's um she's Canadian. She's a former. I don't I don't know if she has world titles, but I know she's she was world class. Um, mid she's fired up, man. She was yeah. the what, And one thing one thing about her is um even when I saw her, she, she it wasn't a twenty year layoff because I've seen her pull a couple years ago. She in and out. She pulls now and then. But <clears throat> even though she maybe was not in top shape previously. When she goes to the table, it's all business. Like she gives nothing, she concedes nothing. Um, strong, competitive. 
um, intangibles, all that stuff. So, but I, I would have her at a massive underdog against this, uh, against, uh, against Carlson. So uh, props to her. Um, I know she's living in California now. Um, so maybe she's training consistently. Who knows? But props to her. I would have never given her a chance in this match. Yeah, and she seemed taller. She had a long hand, so I expected her to top roll. No, she was a yeah. monster booker. I mean, like she was diving in every single match. She oh, was the she, more yeah, booker. She, like, that was that was the cool thing. Yeah, it she, wasn't that yeah. finger wrestling stuff that we usually see in the U.S. from a female arm wrestling standpoint, women's arm wrestling. Yeah. I mean, she was I going mean, ball to the wall. Find a way to watch it. She's a fighter. Good for her. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy that one probably. <clears throat> the most out of all the matches. Yeah. Well, wow. could be. Yeah. Um, next match was Rob Vigent, Craig Toulier. Um, Rob ended up winning 3 1. Um, did you see all the matches, uh, Gabby? Were you able to see a replay? Uh, I, I saw one, but I just, prior to this, I just kind of felt bad for Craig because I thought whoever runs that mime page was just way too harsh on Craig. I mean, come on. Three mimes in, in a 48 hour period leading up to the match. Give the guy a break. I know I've been critical, but I mean, come on. I think it's Jonathan Lava or Ryan Thames that runs that page, but I mean, come on, you have to show a little bit of tolerance. Anyway, so I was a little bit disappointed in that. And and to what I saw, he didn't um, either either Wall cracked down or he didn't foul that much. But one one thing I did see is I, I would think I, I thought that if once once um, Rob got into a full controlled hook match, it would be like three seconds pin. Um, and the match that I saw, uh, wow, Craig hung in there for. 15, 17 seconds, uh, just grinding away. So, again, props to Craig. Looks like his his strength is not that far off from Rob's. Rob just looked like he had such a strong, deep cup in that hook um, because he has the bigger, longer hand, and um, he just had more hand control in the hook. And that, that was that, that was enough. Yeah, they said Craig weighed in at 199. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to – I don't believe any of these weights. Um, okay. They, they also said Rob weighed in at two hundred three. You think he's that light? No, I don't. I, I believe I believe Rob's heavier, and I believe Craig's lighter. I also believe um, Devin did not weigh at two sixty three. I don't believe it. No one can convince me. I'd have to see it. I don't. Uh, I'm not convinced. I don't believe it. All right, we'll get to there later. Yeah. What uh, What do you think, Joe, of the Rob and Craig match? Uh, I I was actually shocked. I realistically. Uh, I was thinking that Rob was coming into this pretty fired up and was going to just, just kind of go crazy and just power through him uh, quicker than he did, right? So when the match stopped uh, and it was kind of hook on hook, um, it surprised me when Rob surged a couple times and he opened up his arm a little bit. You know, I was like, damn, well, Craig's right there, you know, at least mm. it's close. And it seemed like Craig laid, not really laid down, but just didn't really grind the first, what, two matches, I think. And then that last one, he pulled until, I mean, it was, it was good. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it didn't quite go the, the way that I thought it was going to go. I thought it would be a little bit easier for, uh, for Rob just being how, how it went last time. I thought he'd be pretty, pretty hungry to get the, Sweet. Yeah. What what I take out of that match is Craig's bicep. Uh, I I didn't think Craig's bicep can hang in there. I know his yeah. on the on the attacking side of the table, his hook is devastating. He's got a strong explosive hit. Um, but like I said, the hook you know the hook has different areas on the table, and he's mostly an attacking hook. His strength mostly lies in the attacking area of the hook, not so much the defensive area. And to him to hold off Rob like that, with Rob had full hand control, shoulder behind the hand, all that stuff, everything you could want, and still struggle to to pin the twenty the, the the much lighter, well much lighter, maybe maybe anywhere from fifteen to thirteen to fifteen pounds lighter, um, which can be significant. Um so my win or lose, I tell, I give props to Craig on that one. Uh, I didn't think it would be that close. I had Rob yeah, I winning. I had Rob winning. Well you heard me say I, I thought Rob was gonna um, you know, stonewall him and pose. I was wrong. Yeah, I was wrong also. I mean, I think yeah. the rest did a pretty good job. Um, I think Craig did a pretty good job. I mean... Yeah, I all, agree. Yeah, we're all going to elbow foul. Like, it happens. Uh, oh, yeah. But the rest of it, Craig gets back in the setup. Craig goes back in the offensive. Um, I didn't see a lot of the the, the super fouls, I think, that we would have seen. Did um, you think they were a little yeah. extra critical of him? I don't think they were extra critical. But I think WAL had to make um, adjustments 
because it doesn't make sense. So yeah. it doesn't make sense to us as arm wrestlers. But if you if you read the comments on YouTube and on WAL posts, they have strictly arm wrestling fans, non non arm wrestlers that are saying these files are crazy. This makes no sense. Because if you go to the website, they describe what a foul is and then they watch the show and they go, what the fuck is this? They're not calling anything. It would be like watching a football game and everyone knows you can't go out of bounds or and, you know, they go out bounds of bounds anyways. and people are running in and out all the time and no one's saying anything. <laughs> so I think they had to make a call and, uh, you know, have some integrity or at least follow their own rules. But um, now, I think the refs did a good job. I think Craig did a good job. Right. I think I think Craig was far stronger than like I would have expected. I still don't understand why Rob isn't just creaming the guy. Um, just because it's Rob. has nothing to do with Craig. I mean, <laughs> Rob should be creaming everybody. Like, I, don't, I don't understand. I don't know if he's still injured or if his shoulder's messed up and he doesn't have the side pressure. Just, I mean, I, I think it's odd. I agree. Do you think that a couple of those uh, surges from Craig were pins? I don't know which uh, match it was, but damn, dude, some of those were really close. Yeah, it's hard with the camera angles and stuff like that. Um, I'd probably have to go watch a, a replay. But, I'm just going um, off of just how far Rob's arm was opened up. I was like, oh, man, you got to go, man. I have a theory that Rob moonlights as a, a professional video game dude and sits at home. I picture him on the couch all day, not training, playing video games, uh, watching the kids periodically while the wife goes to work, and then – a month out of a big competition, he starts lifting like an 80 pound dumbbell and then shows up and cause that's how physically gifted he is. And I don't understand how someone with those tools can't be just walking through 240 guys, 230 guys. Cause his bicep hand, there are parts of him that are more um, muscularly dominant than 250 pound guys. I mean, he's got a super heavyweight hand, super heavyweight bicep, little teeny waist, little legs. Uh, the dude, 20 inch arms. No, <laughs> it's, I, yeah, it's it's insane. Like he's just a a, a, a genetic marvel. Um, and so, so you, what you're saying is is that Rob Vigent is basically Derek Smith with better genetics. <laughs> what I'm saying is 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 Rob's um, a textbook um, underachiever with um, unbelievably godly um, um, genetics. Just, uh, it's, he's he's, uh, he's an anomaly. Um, you know. Follow-up question. Right. Rob wants Todd Hutchings. No, he doesn't. Boom. That's it. No. He says that. I'd like to see him say that. Because um, uh, if, if you watch, again, well, I'm going to go into the rant of, of, of the decade when we get onto the to Todd Devin deal. But um, Rob wants no part of Todd. Uh, maybe at, at 205 pounds, I say, yeah. yeah. So, nah, fuck that. Rob, for Rob, the way he's built, to, to, to say, and look, what Rob's what, 32 years old, or 33 years old, to say to a 50 year old, hey, I want you to drop 30 pounds, get the fuck out of here. Like, you know, if Rob wants Todd, you know, Todd should be able to come in at whatever, like 220, 230. Well, uh, I'm Rob, sorry, I don't want to watch that. I would say this. I mean, I would say before a few years ago, before Todd and WAL came about, Rob never complained about weight. Rob never, Rob never even mentioned weight. He was the anti-weight guy. He always said it didn't matter. But I would say in recent years, it matters more now to him um, because of Todd Hutchings. Mm. Um, let's see. So I guess we'll get to the uh, main event. Um, <laughs> Devin Larratt versus uh, Todd Hutchings. So... According to the WAL, Devin weighed in at 263 and Todd weighed in at um, 244, something like that. Um, Devin ends, ends up winning 3 0. Um, thoughts, Joe? I'll let you go first. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to watch Devin King's move. Just because when I came into the sport, he was posing on people, you know, center table, just dominating, right? And now he's, I hate to use Chris's words, but he's running. And it's not like a dominating top role. It's its a 
very evasive move. I'm not a I'm not a fan of the Kings move. Period. I I just I don't know. It's it's ugly. It looks ugly. I don't like pulling when your arms opened up. You know, it's looks it just looks bad, especially for people who aren't uh, arm wrestlers. They're gonna see that and be like, "What the fuck is that?" Mm -hmm. Um, Todd. I thought he would have more inside, or not not inside. I thought he would be able, even with his hand back, I thought he would be able to uh, possibly beat Devin's king move, even so. And, well, he he did the first match for sure, but uh, I thought the calls were some suspect here and there. Um, it did surprise me when Devin finished him fast the last match. I thought he was going to, you know, drag it out. Who's imposing, make it all entertainment. But what do you do? It's the WAL. None of us should be surprised at all by any of this, really. I mean, they're focused on the bottom line. They always have been and they always will be. And they're a business, rightfully so. It just it sucks as an arm wrestler to, who's got as much passion for the sport to see it and to have to explain it to new people and, and even people who – uh, who don't arm wrestle, you know, like, well, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't how our, all arm wrestling is. And to say those words sucks. Mm -hmm. That's my thoughts. Thoughts, Gabby? So, um, I thought, I was talking to a guy at work uh, last week about this, and he just started following arm wrestling. He's not an arm wrestling, just following. And he mentioned this match, and I said, in my opinion, this is the most, in my years in the sport, this is the matchup that I wanted to see the most. And he said, well, why? And I said, because it's arguably the best in the world, who's arguably a power arm wrestler, um, known as, uh, in his heyday, going against uh, a power guy. So you can see, finally, we're going to see. Uh, and he says, you think so? And I said, well, theoretically, but um, Devin is now, like I said, Devin is now a runner. And a couple of years ago, you'd see Devin against Matt, Matt Mask, and he would run a little bit, but then he'd hook some other guys, and he was a partial runner. Um, now he's going against a 50-year-old, um, a lighter, lighter athlete, and I'll break it down. Um, so first match, um, Todd's initial surge pins Devin. It's not called. No, or maybe it's a pin, maybe it's not, but it's damn fucking close. I've seen a lot, a lot, of, things get, a lot of things get called that were higher up. So anyway. I agree. So, so Todd's surge now the match gets stopped. Now Devin, of course, um, to to block his side pressure, um, has to get pronation, and he gets he doesn't have straight enough back pressure and pronation. So what he does is he like like Marcio did. He go, gets under the table. Now what happens is, as he's under the table and he's rocking back and forth, and he's just he has pronation, he has hand control on Todd. He can just sit there. He's getting you know he's absorbing every hit, and Todd is kind of like in a. For every second that goes by, even though they're both kind of open, Todd's exerting a lot more energy. So. Todd got robbed. Todd should have got that match. Um, anyway, so as, as, as the match progresses um, and Todd fatigues, uh, that's the end. That's it. That's it right there. Like He was drained. It was going to go 3-0. Um, so that missed call um, dictated the, the whole match. But that's not even the biggest th the takeaway. The biggest takeaway is, as I saw, I took a couple of uh, frame photos and a, a, a photo of Devin in, in the full king which is, of course, in the, he's on the defensive side of the table, shoulder under the pad. So even by wall standards, if they're calling the rule to the letter of the law, it's, 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 a, it's a loss or even a foul and losing position, whatever. Uh, but it's an illegal move. They don't call it. Not only do they not call it, his elbow, his whole, the whole ball of his elbow is off the pad, not called. But both Bart and his girlfriend or wife or the, the downside ref are staring. You can see them focusing at the hands. They're, they're what a lot of refs do called, called match watching. When really each ref has to be looking at the elbow. That's all they have to fucking do after the match starts. They're in a strap, so they don't have to worry about slipping. They're, they should be looking at elbow fouls. Neither of them are looking at elbow fouls. They're looking straight, straight dead center of the table at the hands. So you have potentially the best match ever, totally um, destroyed by, by, by arguably the number one running all over the fucking place and avoiding power at any cost. And then you have him benefiting by the most ignorant fucking refing I've ever seen for a $20,000 match or whatever it is. Like, you have $2 Was refs. Was it really 20K? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't know what it is. Now, Bart's... I, I think Bart's a fine ref. Um, but they're both staring at the hand. And, they were. That screenshot like, you took... Like, 
I'm, and goal. I ref tournaments and I'm not a, a certified ref and you'll never see me do that. I'm always looking at, I always tell the downside ref, he looks at one a pad, I look at the other pad and we're fixated on elbow fouls because that's basically once the match starts, that's, that's, those are the infractions that are going to happen after the, the ready go. And I just thought it was, it's blasphemous, it's tragic and uh, I lost a lot of respect for Devin. He had this opportunity to not pull a runner. He had, he's not pulling Travis, he's not pulling, um, you know, uh, a big super heavyweight runner or whatever he's he's pulling a guy who just wants to match uh to stop and wants to see who's stronger and who's lighter and older and here we go Devin to the back of the pad under the table full Michael Todd mode um getting the breaks getting everything um and then getting all jacked and hyped and slapping the table when he wins anyway so so I guess my comments on it um yeah, possibly a no pin um, in the first match. It was really interesting how Todd just sliced right through the right through Devin's arm, um, and then you know as the match goes on, you see Todd's fatigued. Devin has full control, kind of do whatever he wants. But prior to this match, I was telling my dad that this was going on, and he knows enough about arm wrestling to know who Todd is. He's met Todd, he's met Bob Brown and Leonard, and he knows who Devin is, so he could he knew this was a big thing. And I, I was quick to uh, temper, you know, his, you know, I guess, excitement for as a casual fan in that um, this is now the age of uh, arm wrestling entertainment. Right. Mm-hmm. This is not um, this is not. Yeah, this is not the WAF championships. It's not a tournament setting where you just have to go and kill everybody. Um, it's all about the entertainment factor. So. Regardless of how this turned out, I knew that this was going to be drawn out. Devin wasn't going to go for kill shots. Um, it was just going to be made to look better. But do you Maybe do you, be, do you believe? I agree. Right. I agree with everything you say. But do you believe Devin sandbagged? So I'm getting to that point. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to. You're, you'll you'll be on my side by the end of this. Okay. So I truly believe that in that match, Todd sliced through him that easily. I truly believe that Devin went inside, and it was tough. And um, and Devin had to roll out of that hook, right? But and I'll agree with uh, the voice of arm wrestling. I watched their uh, review of the of the match this morning, and what they said was spot on. Devin didn't prepare for this match like someone who had to win. Devin was traveling all around the world. He was arm wrestling people for days on end. He didn't truly peak. He didn't truly rest. Yeah, he gained some weight and ate into the event, but this was not how Devin would have prepared if this was a $50,000 match. This was Devin going against a smaller, older, shorter, less technical guy with a lesser hand, and he knew he could win no matter what. And the benefit of him coming in weak or not prepped was that maybe you'd have a more interesting match, right? Maybe Todd would slice through him. Maybe the hook would be more interesting. Um, So in a real setting, where someone says, Devin, you make money on every pin. Devin, you make money on how fast you pin this guy. A different Devin shows up, and this match looks completely different. Devin goes outside quick and presses him quick. And I think that was my assessment before. And again, the tide that I pulled is not the tide that exists today. But I knew Devin could take Todd's hand. I knew Devin's length would allow him to be on top of Todd's arm. He wouldn't even have to go through the arm. All he has to do is top roll and press. Um, and Devin's going to get a better setup than Todd because he's Devin and because it's the WAL. So I thought, the whole, I mean, again, fun to watch because I'm a fan of arm wrestling, but I thought the whole thing was a sham. Um, and it's kind of a disservice to anyone that I think knows um, real arm wrestling and knows what um, Devin can really do. Um, so I think it's kind of a bummer. I think it's a bummer for Todd. Um, mm-hmm. Um, cause if you're like Todd or, or even like myself, I would have rather you just smoke me three Oh, and I know exactly where I am. I think Todd's got a false, a false signal from this match. I don't think he's that close. I don't think Todd's really going to cut through Devin's bicep like that. I don't know if the setup looks the same way. If Devin has to pin Todd in two seconds, um, on the first round, um, you know, if Devin was pulling Dennis, he wouldn't, I don't think he'd be traveling the way he did. I don't think he'd be pulling as much as, as, as he did. He'd probably have like a two-month prep cycle where he's probably shutting most things down. So um, unless Devin's so sort of, uh, I'm going to pull Dennis. I know I'm going to lose. I'll just go collect my check. 
in that case, yeah, Devin may be traveling the globe and doing the PR stuff. But if it's a match that Devin's supposed to win against the best in the world, I don't think he preps this way. I agree. I, I think that's why we have a good show because I'm visceral and sometimes over, overly emotional and you're always cerebral and objective. So I, I, I didn't think of it. All of what you did, you said, I it never, it never registered in my mind, but you're absolutely right. It makes complete sense. It does. Yeah. I never yeah. even thought about him traveling and everything like that. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Correct. And I mean, and, and, and Devin will tell you, Oh, he's top five in the world. Right hand. He'll play with people. Right hand. Yeah. I'll and I mean, play with people. And I mean, we can argue he's not top 10 and all that other stuff, but the dude's a bad dude. Todd is still, you know, a 190 pound frame guy, right? Todd in Europe, they wouldn't let him get that big. They, the, the government would put him into a 187 class and they'd have him ripped up, right? He's not that big. Um, so yeah, Devin should clean that up pretty easy. And I know he can. I, I just think that we're talking about a disservice to Todd. You know, you're talking about uh, not... Devin not fully uh, committing to a certain type of training only because maybe he doesn't feel he needs it. But t- we know Todd absolutely did. Uh, we know Todd, how he prepares and how he focuses. And, you know, I don't know how many years oh, we have left. I don't know how many years we have left of watching this fucking gladiator peak um, and being blessed by it. But we just got robbed of his um, raw strength and intensity two ways by, by a runner and by idiotic refing. Um, and it's, and I feel bad for Todd because, you know, we're watching. Who cares, you know? Yeah, I, it, it didn't go the way I wanted. 20 minutes later, I was watching hockey. Like, who gives a shit? But, you know, Todd is – I fucking feel bad for Todd and, and uh, his wife. And I don't know. I, I, I just think um, he just – you know, he's fucking it's, – it's like having Babe Ruth come to the plate and you're paying, you know, X amount of money to watch him play baseball – Back in you know nineteen fourteen, and they pitch around him. They they won't even throw to him. They they pitch out wide. They walk him for all four at bats. And you're like, well, uh, what a waste of a you know. Like, uh, so I, I don't know who's more to blame. Is it Wall? Is it Devin? But I can tell you one thing. Um, it's not Todd. Win or lose, that dude's a that dude's a fucking you know. In in a world that's that's um, slowly uh, losing its masculinity. This dude's a still a fucking hot rod gladiator, and uh, I just, I'm just still proud of him. And you know, I just, I, I just think it's a shame. But at no point did I ever lose a little bit of admiration for that guy. That dude's a fucking god. I just think he dude, got robbed. And, and Devin said he was going inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Devin's becoming more. Devin. Well, he actually set up. He set up to go inside in the in the big like the first little bit of their first match. He he was setting up like like Jerry Cataracts, like when he set up against him and then it changed immediately. I was like, damn. Yeah. Devin, uh, Devin, Devin five, six, seven years ago was what Todd Hutchins ultimately what you can compare him to now. Um, you know, you're talking about a gladiator and an inside power puller. And now he's like the Jerry Springer of arm wrestling. He reverts to these circus tricks. He's prancing the globe, hanging out with, the likes of fucking Bowen and super fans and getting paid 40 bucks a pop to do to seminars, uh, hanging out all corners of the globe and, uh, fine. It's his prerogative, but the, the person who lost the most out of this was Todd. Uh, so I just, you know, anyway, it is what it is. Maybe we'll see it again, but, uh, like, like I, like I predicted, well, like many people predicted, he was going to run all over the place and he ran. Can you believe that there is a large portion of the arm wrestling fan base, you know, that's been built up over the last five years that only know the Kings move, Devin? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, I guess other things to discuss regarding the uh, event overall or some other things that I saw. Um, as much as you, we can talk about the refing in the Todd and Devin match, the missed pin, the missed elbow maybe. Um Man, I think they did a hell of a job with the Rob and Craig match. Um, you know, and it wasn't so much that it didn't – they called the foul, but it didn't take away from the match, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought I thought, it, I thought they did pretty good. I think WAL is trying to clean it up based on mm. maybe community feedback. Uh, I see a lot of new fans or non-arm wrestlers commenting on WAL stuff about, you know, the elbow fouls. It looks weird. You know, you read the rules. It says you can't lift your elbow up, but then they don't. they never call it. 
So I think they did a pretty good job um, last night um, overall. Yeah. Uh, you know yeah. They got that one right. The, the, the Craig and RVJ match, they definitely got that one right. Yeah, I think it was 3-1, but even then, I mean, it was a lot closer than that. I mean, there right. were a lot of pins that got that got reset, and so there was a lot more excitement to it. There wasn't just four pins. I mean, it was, it was yeah. some pretty good stuff. I think they're having to, to, to crack down and, and to tighten up because they're getting just hammered in the comments on, on every platform. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even matter where you go, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram, wherever they post a video that's, you know, quote unquote controversial, people just crush them in the comments yeah. and it, they've earned it, you know? I mean, yeah. so, okay. So, so here's, here's my next point and the um, uh, audience member just mentioned it. And so Robert Lopez says, on the match that Craig won, did anyone see the down ref call an elbow foul on Craig and it just got ignored? <laughs> right. And I, I do remember that. I mean, it wasn't a clear call because I think she was kind of off camera, but there was definitely some discussion about what the down, what the down ref called. Rob was asking for the foul. Um, and I even remember the camera cutting. Oh, it went under review and the camera cuts to, I guess, the side judges. And who was at the table with them? It was Steve Kaplan. Um, I thought yeah, it was I saw that. So this goes back to the arm wrestling entertainment aspect of it. You know, they're, they're well, I don't know. When they showed the replay to the us, the viewer, they showed the last surge. And so I didn't I didn't really see a call there. So I thought it was okay. Maybe there was one on a prior surge. But just to see Kaplan down there, the guy's not an arm wrestler, he's not a referee. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a foul that he would say, oh, no, let it ride. You know what I mean? Because you need a show. Um, that doesn't happen. And come on. Yeah. Um, other comments, the stage looked weak. I mean, it was more like uh, a, a down step from what they were doing last year. Um, it looked like they put the I table. Agree. They put a table on a small platform on the concrete floor of the facility or gym they were in. Um, so maybe that's cost cutting or cost management. Um, yeah, it seemed like, it seemed like a lower quality event, um, than what they were doing last year. Um, what's your thoughts on them charging? Uh, the 299. Well, yeah, I mean, setting it up a week prior, just deciding, oh, Hey, this is probably going to be our biggest match. We should probably charge people. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought WAL just mismanaged stuff. Um, like their page should be bigger and better than what it is. Their website should be bigger and better. Their YouTube presence should be bigger and better. Um, I think Ryan Bowen hit the nail on the head. The 299 is not worth it. You make it free. You get five to 10 times more viewers. And then that hits your ad revenue and you make more money that way. Um, yeah, I, agree. I think Ryan, Ryan's very smart, um, you know, and what he's doing. I mean, even in the stuff that I've been researching on how you do the social media stuff, Ryan hits all the nails right on the head. And I don't understand how someone like Kaplan, not that he wouldn't know how to do these things or needs to know. I don't understand how with his resources, he doesn't have, maybe not Ryan Bowen, but some YouTube social media nerd doing the work. Like it just doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. You, you, my friend, just answered your own question. I believe Yeah, I believe you'll find out, in the, and Joan, Joan knows where I'm leading with this, but you'll find out in the next week or two that by some way, Bowen has um, uh, burrowed his way into Kaplan's pants, uh, figuratively speaking, and we'll, you'll, you'll see. You know, the, the world's biggest super fan will uh, will have something. To I say. knew you were going to lead. I knew you were uh, going to say something about that, Chris. I knew yeah. you were. Yeah, yeah. He's a predictor. He, he's he's doing the live stream. Yeah, he's a good. He, oh, yeah. he he knows his shit, right? Like Herman says, the guy knows social media. Talking yeah. about Bowen. Um, Dude, his marketing is good. Oh yeah, it is. he knows he's not a dummy. I'll, I'll never say he's stupid. That's that's absolutely one hundred percent for sure. But yeah, well, he's he's predictable when it comes to uh, you know, snaking his oh, way. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying uh, Ryan gave uh, Kaplan the old Walmart? I don't know if he gave him the whole Walmart, but <laughs> but, uh, but hey. I, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, the belt opened up and the zipper partially went down. I won't say all the way down. Yeah. yeah, it would take a lot of years to, to do the full Walmart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. You guys are saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So I mean, that that's uh, what that, that, that's what that's always bothered me. It's just how they how they run stuff. You know, yeah. again, only three months of social media research and all this bull crap. I think I could run WAL hell of a lot better. I could get WAL more exposure. But if they bring Ryan on or someone like with their resources, I mean, it, it, it would have to be crazy because I think Ryan's done a whole lot with far less. You know, I did. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He has, you know, yeah, without a doubt. Um, so, yeah, I can see Kaplan listening to Bowen and Bowen playing a little bit of a role in, in the social media aspect of wall going forward for sure. It would only make oh, sense. Yeah. yeah. If it doesn't happen, I'll be shocked. Put yeah. it that way. Yeah, yeah. That's well, that's how far it goes right now. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they go, "Wow, this guy's super smart, knows what he's doing, can tenfold our uh, <laughs> views." Yeah, we probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, everyone was really happy that we called elbow fouls. Let's take that. Let's just go back to how we used to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I don't know. You guys got uh, anything else? Uh. Ah, uh, didn't 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 uh, Joe just compete in a tournament last last weekend? How'd that go? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Where, uh, where it was, was good. Where was the tournament, Joe? Give us the background. Uh, the tournament was ran by USAA. It was in Reno. It was the first Arnold qualifier of the year for next year's Arnold. Uh, I went down there with Jake Houston and I. Um, it was, I mean, the venue. It's probably one of the best venues that I've been to, like the setup, uh, the lighting, the stage. It was just perfect. Uh, well, I mean, it was at a nightclub, essentially, hooked up to the casino. It's just unfortunate that we had, like, a really weak turnout. I mean, we, we had the, the armistices that were there were quality, but we just needed more. I mean... For example, like I told you guys, I was the only 154 open puller. Like they took the amateur and master pullers and put them into my class, which thank you, Denise, because it would have really sucked to, to not get to pull anyone. You know, it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. But it was awesome. Was, I mean, I, I had a great time. Were there cash prizes? Uh, actually, crazy. There was no cash payouts. It was just custom awards, free T-shirts, and then uh, overall jacket. To, or you know, you won a. The overall winners got custom jackets, uh, kind of like the Arnold. But they had cash boxes, drawings for your your entry fees. Whatever class you entered, you got a raffle ticket. Well, I won the two hundred and fifty dollar cash box. Nice. nice. So, I mean, that was that was pretty sick. And they did that before the event started, so it was just like, boom. Yeah, so like it comes down to location, too many tournaments, all that stuff. I mean, I think Reno yeah. is probably nine hours from Bakersfield, which is two hours north from Los Angeles. So that's an eleven hour drive for what is that's the that bulk. Far? For, for hold on, it's eleven hour drive from LA, which is the bulk of the California pullers. I thought right. it was like three hours, dude. No, so if you're in Reno, yeah, that's northern Vegas, northern Nevada. Nevada has a very small base, so you're 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 shot in the foot already. There's few, there's even there's few local pullers in Nevada, so now you have to rely on other states. And so, yep, you might get the Northern California uh, that Armbenders group and Tom Nelson, but then again, a lot of those guys were Game of Arms guys. They were WAL guys. Game of Arms gets canceled, and they're all burnt out, so they don't even show up anymore. They don't they don't pull, right? Not I was serious. surprised uh, that they, Luke showed up. They were, they were, they're all, they were all, you know, gassed up on the dream and the TV. That how yeah. can you go to a local tournament anymore? Like we saw that, we saw the decline yeah. in California. So good luck getting those guys to a Reno event, right? I I had no idea that it was that far, and I did know that, being as there was no cash, I knew that was going to play a role, right? Like. No payouts to first, second, third. I, I knew that was gonna that was gonna affect the draw, which yeah. Correct. And so uh cash boxes, I'm not flying from Louisiana to Reno for that. No, I know, right? right? And, I know, and so I know there's no cash. So uh you might get some Northern California guys, you might get a couple Nevada guys. No one from Southern California is really gonna go, or at least not a ton of people. I know Rob Vigent's not going, and Rob Vigent knows I'm not going. 
So we're not going to those events. Yeah, so no, I know. It's, just, it's just unfortunate. I mean, but, you know, I know promoters are going to put on events regardless. I mean, I, I don't get it, you know. The bodybuilding show was pretty cool. I mean, it was cool. Other than that, yeah. So let's talk training a bit. How are training going with you guys? Herman? Um, after that Mississippi event, I probably took a, a couple weeks off. Um, I'm in the process of renovating um, a house I just bought. So um, and training's been kind of non-existent. I did start back up this week. I feel good. And so I'm about to hit another gear. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I think I'm going to start over, um, build up a better base. Um, my endurance seemed a little weak in Mississippi. So instead of doing all the singles and maxing out, um, I'm just going to build up a program from the bottom, more volume, and then taper off over time as my tournament schedule sort of uh, fills out. But yeah, overall, I'm strong. Good man, Joe. Uh, I probably should have took this week off after Reno. I was a little sore after the the weight cut. I got a little cocky in this last weight cut. I ate. <laughs> ate a little bit of shit food last week during the week and I had two extra pounds to get rid of and uh, definitely played a role where I feel like I probably should have took this week off and I've I trained twice hard already on the table and in the gym once and it's uh I mean I'll be okay it's just I definitely know that I probably should have took some time off and my new training schedule is kind of basically taking full effect now after this Essentially, that'll be training for Michigan State slash the Gobby match. Michigan State, August, uh, September? Yeah, August uh, August 10th. Yeah. Nice. Either August 7th or August 10th, one of the two. But I'll train. Like, I'll, I'll have this new structured program, and I'll do that and just peek and kind of play with things until – uh, until I need to start tapering for Michigan. And then I'll probably get a little bit more training in after Michigan, but realistically from August to October is not a whole lot. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to go balls to the wall again and, and then have to you know, re-rest all that stuff. So just, but I'm going back up and wait. I'm not, I'm not cutting anymore for uh, smaller events or anything like that. I'm just going to. Now, b before you overcommit to that, that idea, Jody. Did you see that Steve's adding a 143 to Michigan State? Oh, you can stay away from Gobby. You can stay away from Gobby. You, Dude, I've wanted to pull you. Even if I lose, it doesn't matter. I still want to pull you, man. Hey, like, wait, 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 are you guys meeting at Michigan State before the super match? We will. What's we might pull. It might happen. I don't know what class you're pulling, Chris, but I mean, it, it could happen. Am I going to cut to 54? Is he going to cut to 54? Like, both of us need to cut. So is one of, are we both going to cut? Neither of us going to cut? So it could happen. Or well, do you want to lose or not? Yeah. Uh, the, match, the match I want to see in Michigan State is uh, in the, in the uh, 242s, I believe it is. Or is it? Yeah, I think that's a 242 class before Super Heavyweight. I want to see Jeremy Boyd and Herman Stevens. Right-handed. Dude, Super I'm not going to Michigan. Uh, we no. Boy. Not, hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, before you get your hopes up, dude, uh, Jeremy's having surgery, dude. He's not pulling, I don't think, Michigan this year. Ah, oh, fuck. Too bad. Yeah, I know. I was bummed too, man. And even so, I think he would be pulling the 220s. Yeah, I'm just fucking around. I'm just trying to coerce Herman to coming up to Michigan State. Dude, you should go, Herman. Going it's a good time. Sick to you, dude. You pull. What's that? I'm going to Minnesota to watch you two pull. Yeah, that's true. But you guys, you guys should seriously not pull in Michigan. I'm cool well, with that. Dude, if, if this you really you really think really think hey, Chris. It's going to ruin it. We, we need the Minnesota thing to happen. If the Super It's happens, going to happen. Yeah. But realistically, Chris, you should pull 76 anyways because you're the fucking defending left-hand champ, right? I'm pulling 76 left. I'm definitely – well, right, too. I'm definitely going to pull 76. The question is, um, depending on my well, weight, well, I don't do cuts. Um, but sometimes, like lately, I've been – I can sit at one – 59 160 if that's the case it's an easy easy cut to 54 and i'd only do it to get two more gorillas 
Um, but my silvers? Do you really want to settle for two sil- two more silvers, though? And and to to Herm's point, we should really we shouldn't be pulling. So my my <laughs> advice to you is: if you see me in the A bracket, get the fuck out of my way and lay down. That's the, the- oh what you should lay down to me. Oh yeah. Hey, just look, Gobby. You take seventy sixes. Joe take takes fifty fours. We we can't yeah. ruin. It. He's gonna be ruined if you guys. I know. I I'm I'm fully on board, and I've thought about this. I was like, you know what? Potentially, my plan right now is to for surely pull fifty fours. But if Chris were to pull the fifty fours, dude, we're going to meet up. It's actually I, what most likely is more probable is me pull seventy sixes and the left pull up to ninety eights and put a whooping on King. Roger. Actually, uh, yeah, I, pff, dude, you should pull ninety eight left for sure. Why not? I think top three is not totally, totally unrealistic. Depending on who's in the seventy six, of course, too, and depending on the breaks I have in between. But uh, we'll see. But it'll, it'll be fun. I just thought yeah, I'm saying ready. like you, the channel is the priority. Like yeah, this yeah. event in Minnesota is the priority. This is our like this is our bottom two or yeah. bottom three event. <laughs> Oh man, this is gonna be good. Uh, it'll be with, fun. It'll be fun. We got a very young Craig Souvlier, right? So it's like, yeah, you can't. Fuck <laughs> <do that. laughs> you, dude. You know, in a 152 pound package. Unreal. All right, um, we got some questions coming in. Um, quick question: um, Anyone going to nationals in Oklahoma? Uh, no. You mean the pro am? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm going. Okay, Joe's going. Chris, and I, Chris is not going to that. Chris, Wait, you going? Chris is going to? No. Okay, yeah, I'm not going. So that that question is done. Um, thoughts on Matt Mask versus uh, Todd Hutchings? Stupid. You know, give Todd. You know, you're 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 pairing up Ferraris and diesel trucks. Give a diesel truck a diesel truck. Give a fucking Ferrari another fucking Ferrari. Like. Poor, <laughs> fucking rangy, tall runner, like who's gonna run away? Get and and, and Matt will will do whatever he has to. Like give to, like Marcio and Todd was good. Ron Bath and Todd was good. Give that fucker a, a a big heavy fucking inside puller who's not gonna run run all over the place. Like, uh, like give, who? Give Chris him, who? Give him RVJ. Of course, RVJ doesn't want any part of that. He he already beat Marcio. He beat Bath. Uh, Berzink's done. Who the fuck else gonna be? Chafee would hurt him. Uh, Chafee's a little bit too too um, too heavy. Who the fuck could it be? But I mean, I don't know. But for the love of God, give that guy a give him a fucking truck. Don't give him a fucking Ferrari. I, I don't even know who he would pull. What a stupid match that is. I, I don't even think I'd watch that match. If it even slows down, Todd's side pressure will just destroy that guy. And if he's gifted enough to run like Devin did and get underneath, and you know, uh, then it'll be it'll be the same thing we saw. I'll probably a little bit longer because uh, Matt can't probably can't finish as well once the match stops or or adjust the way Devin can. But what a shitty matchup that is. Uh, yeah, I don't want to see that. Yeah. And no offense to any anyone, just I just I don't want to see it. I, I don't. No. no. And and because of those pads, they kind of encourage that that back running game right because of the pad the pads are extended but they're only extended on the back end it's not like they add a half an inch to the front and the back it's all on the back which means uh the, the king the king move guys now if they if perfect the front only what you'd happen you'd see a lot of guys driving in driving in driving in so kaplan or any of you fucking yahoos are you listening think about that make the pads an inch on the inside instead of the outside and you'll have a lot more wars and um good strong matches and less fucking Ferraris in reverse running away. <laughs> it's a fucking, really, man, I, I'm. It, it's getting real tiresome. Like, I won't watch Devin pull again. I just won't watch it. Uh, I won't watch it. He, he's he's kinging everything now. He's he like like Herman said. He he he, he start you know doing king move twenty percent of the time. Then every once in a while, now it's it's automatic king. It's like no, I don't watch Michael Todd, and I won't watch him. You know, give me a real arm wrestler to watch. Someone who's not running underneath and back. You know, top rolling, like you said, if, if you would have straight up top roll, because top roll is, although it's slight evasion, it's not really a good, clean, hard top roll is not really running. Um, there's a lot of power and torque involved in a strong top roll. But the, So am I a runner? Well, you're, you're not really anything because you're not. Oh, what you do has Jesus. not. 
it's like it's like you're still bringing the tricycle to the racetrack. Like you have like, oh, one, two, I mean, you, you're nothing. No offense, but like um, but you're you're, you're uh, no taking, Chris. I guess yeah, you're a runner. I mean, I haven't seen you hook uh, in in tournaments. You're you just gotta look. You just gotta dig deeper. But There's not, plenty of matches. But you're not plenty of matches. But like Herman has a running game to his power game. It's not when I say running, it's not totally that bad. Um, but like there's running to just gain a little bit of leverage so you can use more pronation or use, you know, just get a little bit. Of, and that's nothing wrong with that. That's arm wrestling. And that's a good thing. Like I've stated before, but the King thing is, is like extreme running. It's running not only back, but running low. And it, it's, it's using your prone. Like if your pronation is that much do more dominant, you don't need to go low. What happened is your pronation isn't that strong. So to solidify or to stabilize it, you're locking your arm, getting under the table, which keeps your prona pronation in the game, which prevents your opponent to get a full, full hook or to, to, to access um, the, the, you know, a, a good amount of his power. And I just find that's like, shit. I don't know. It's just. I got to get rolling here soon, guys. Yeah. Sorry. All right. No problem. I'm but yeah, um... like top rolling is, you know, a part of the sport. And if we didn't have top rolling, the sport would not be as big as it is. Top rolling is a good thing. Um, I've seen you top roll, Chris. I have. Top rolling, so. not, top rolling is not a terrible thing. In fact, if I did see a Michigan State 54s, I'd roll you just so I wouldn't have to deal with – I can give my bicep a break. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. No one believes that. Dude, you don't even believe that. But the king thing, man – Dude, you're going to top roll a 21-inch arm? Get out of here. No the, way. The wait, 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 wait. 21-inch arm. When I measure arms, wait. it's usually the circumference. Are you measuring arm length now? Well – I, my lever, dude. Have you seen Chris? Have you seen oh, no, him? No, no. Usually, when someone says uh, twenty-one well, inch arm, you're measuring bicep circumference. Well, yeah, I got twenty ones. I mean, check them out. I mean, I don't know. Dude, what do I have? I got like a thirty-six inch arm. I think, dude, you're not pulling anyone. You have your jacked. You're, you're trying so hard not to flex right now. From shoulder to fingertip. Shoulder to fingertip. I don't know yeah. what that is. I was just going yeah. elbow to uh, middle finger. Um, all right. Uh, question. Training question. Yeah. Um, how long would you guys keep an arm wrestling training cycle? How would you structure the programming in terms of intensity and rest? Whether or not it's working or, or what do they mean? How long would you keep it? Like what was the longest? Yeah, how long do, you, do, do you, do you set up a program that lasts a whole year? Do you set up a program that lasts three weeks? I mean, well, uh, for me, it's like three months, like eight weeks, nine weeks. Yeah, it's, well, I guess two months. The more advanced you get, the more um, uh, the more your body adapts to weight training and stuff like that, the quicker you're going to plateau. Basically, the answer to that is you have to pretty much, um, unless you have a really good memory, you have to keep track of your numbers. And every week or every time you do a certain exercise, it should go up micro amounts, minimal. And, and, and at the point where you stop, um, going up, you've plateaued, and whether that's six weeks or sixteen weeks, that's when you have to make the adjustment and, and even bring in a variation or completely change the exercise completely. But it's yeah, it's um, some guys, it, you know, some it, it, you can maybe go sixteen, fifteen weeks, maybe if you're really just starting off, and you can make gains for half a year, maybe. But at at my stage, um, I don't think I've ever run any exercise or that strict variation of any exercise whether it's wrist or shoulders or bench or whatever the hell it is, I don't think I've ever gone past six weeks. If I can make gains from week one to week five, week six, um, I'm lucky enough to make gains, it will plateau at week six and I'll have to rearrange, bring in another variation or completely change the exercise or the rep range. I go, I only work two rep ranges. Um, and, um, you know, so I'll, I'll, it'll be, it'll, it'll be, a, I'll adapt something, but yeah, usually six weeks is, is the most I will run a cycle. Because uh, my body will plateau at that point. Yeah, personally, I would say, I mean, it could be a three week cycles, it could be a three month cycles. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really has to do with uh, frequent training frequency, volume, number of repetitions, and that sort of thing. Um, last few years, I mean, I've just been busy. So my frequency has been down so I could run training programs longer. Um, but in the past, and probably what I'm going to do soon is, when your frequency increases, you're gonna you're gonna burn out sooner, right? So in the past, training three times a day, I probably would end up with a three week training cycle, 
um, just due to burnout. Like I'm going to burn out at the three week mark. It's not going to be a necessarily a choice or I only want to do three weeks. It's usually because I can't go past that, whether it be physical or mental. Um, so I really think it has a lot more to do with your overall training load and maybe some of your philosophies. But um, that's probably where I'm heading in the next step back to two a days and that sort of thing. Yeah. I also to add on to that. I also think that um, if you want to get to a certain level, whether it's um, weightlifting or arm wrestling, there is an exercise or a series of exercises that will get you there quicker because they're optimal. And if they're applied correctly, um, you have to find out what that is. That's why when I find people, I, I see people doing an exercise for pronation or rising or, and they're like, well, it still does something. Yes, it does something. Like anything could do something like resistance training is resistance training. Uh, it can be minimal. It can be optimal. It can be a lot of things in between. But why I'm severe on that is because there's only uh, the window to, to gain and the window to optimize gains and stuff like that is not always um, offered to us. So um, it's, it's important to try to find, uh, depending on what your goal is, to find the optimal exercise and variation to, to suit your needs rather than just to just grab anything that kind of feels good. Um, I think that's uh, where you find me being harsh on, on, on training and stuff is, yes, it works. Yes, it works. But it's nowhere near an optimal exercise to get you where you need to go. All right. Um, no further questions. Any other topics you guys wanted to cover? If not, we can uh, wrap this up. There was a question uh, maybe a month ago. I remember so it, was, it was written in the comments and we never got to it. And I, I even forget who, who asked it, but they said, is there any... Um, merit in the, in the um, in a theory that um, I, I, these say for boxers uh, no sex the night before a tournament or no sex uh, the night before a match meaning that it could fatigue you um, and it, real scientifically what it is is um, it releases testosterone so really it's not a bad thing to have sex the night before a tournament or a competition or whatever um, so uh, whoever asked that question the answer is uh, it releases testosterone so it's not a bad thing despite what the, the old myth is yeah I think Devin answered that maybe a long time ago somewhere and uh, you know I think his comment was was pretty good he said unless you're having like some like wild monkey sex or something yeah. it shouldn't have it shouldn't have an impact but you know I mean if, if some you're getting like uh, the crap beat out of you right or someone's using a strap on you or something I mean that, that might have some impact my, yeah, the biggest, the biggest concern would be if you're a runner or something or maybe like a football player and fatiguing the quads or thighs or something like that. Um, but other than that, nothing. This is the funniest fucking thing ever. Yeah, or or you get the strap used on you and it prevents you from sitting down during the match. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, all right, I think that's a good time. This is a good place to wrap up. Yeah, I think so. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. All right. Take it easy. Later, guys.